studying marine biology and coastal ecology. She has also previously interned for us here at JNCC, as well as CFAS and the Marine Biological Association. And her main academic interests are in fish and fisheries. But the main reason why Georgie is here today is her amazing knowledge of underwater photography and videography. Um, her images have reached high acclaim and have won the British and Irish Underwater Photography Championship in 2020 and has been featured in the Underwater Photographer of the Year for both 2021 and 2022. She is most comfortable working between science and the arts and believes science informs and directs powerful evidence based storytelling and art brings in the bare bones of science to life for people to enjoy the process. And in the future, uh, Georgia hopes to focus more on her filmmaking to bring what she has learned as an ecologist to a wider audience, particularly focusing on species and habitats that are underappreciated in the public. So without further ado, uh, here's Georgie Ball. Hello, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for tuning in. Um, I really appreciate having any opportunity to talk about my work and hopefully get people to get involved in similar fields. Um, I think it's quite a niche field um, that can feel quite inaccessible if you don't have friends or acquaintances around you that do this. So it really means a lot to me to have a platform to share what I'm doing and hopefully get you excited about it too. Um, so I've titled my talk, Why Imagery Matters, the Importance of Photography and Videography in UK Marine Conservation. And I have to admit, there will be more of a photography slant on this, but the lessons are broadly applicable to videography as well. And essentially, uh, if I had to summarise what this will be about uh, and the aims of, of this talk, it's that I really want people from any experience level, whether you've never picked up a camera before or if you take a camera out whenever you go on a walk or a dive, um, to to realise that what you're taking or what you could potentially take with any piece of equipment has value for conservation. Um, and if that's the, the kind of image and then the picture I can get across to you, then I feel like it will be a successful talk. Um, so just a quick sort of introduction and, and format for what I'll be uh, covering. I've decided to put this talk into two parts because from my understanding this is obviously a working day and you might have a, quite a busy schedule and I figured that the the main things that people might want or expect from this talk is some practical tips um, on how to take photos so I, I'll start off the talk in that kind of field and I'll be introducing the kit that I use but also talking about some of the best kit that you might be thinking of using what you might already have and this will be budget friendly I won't be trying to sell you things that are ten thousand pounds <laughs> because um, I often find that when you google underwater photography uh, the, the, the products that usually come up are slightly horrifying um, in terms of their price mark. So this is going to be an introduction to what you can do with a budget that isn't going to break the bank. And some of the things that I wish I'd learn sooner when I started doing this about five years ago. And then part two, I guess it's like an inspiration session and it's slightly more conceptual. And I'll be looking at um, some public perception surveys about native marine life. So specifically focusing on why actually the UK really needs people to be taking photos and getting excited about what's there. Um, and it's not just my anecdotes that support that public perception surveys hint at the same thing. And the power of sharing perspective and why I think that Obviously, as a scientist, I value science and I, I value um, evidence based kind of approaches. But there's a lot to be said for sharing perspectives and making people feel stuff. And I think that statistics can do that. But um, imagery has something really special going for it. And you don't have to be working for the BBC to create something really powerful. Um, and then we'll finish off with a Q&A. Um, and I'm going to try and not waffle on too much so that there's a good sort of 15, 20 minutes for people to have a chat. If you've got specific kind of queries about a piece of kit that you're using um, or a kind of approach that you want to take, I'm more than happy to stay um, beyond the two o'clock if that's needed. If that's OK um, with with Sam, um, more than happy to do that. But you can always email me otherwise. So I just thought, as well as the introduction that Sam very kindly gave, I will um, just cover a really quick bio into how I got into photography. Um, so I started um, photography in 2016, uh, 2017, I think. Yeah, 2017, I've <laughs> forgotten. Um, and I learned to dive in Cornwall in Falmouth. And uh, straight after doing my open water, I took an internship with a really nice guy called Tom from Hydro Motion Media. Um, and he for the most part used a compact camera and he taught me using one of his compact cameras 
kind of the basics and and how to sort of compose things exposure all that kind of stuff um and I before that had developed a weird infatuation for stalking Facebook groups um, where people would post things that they'd found rock pooling and I would get really excited trying to work out what they were from the comfort of my parents house back in Hertfordshire. Um, I didn't grow up by the sea but I always had a weird fascination with it from documentaries and my dad finding fossils and showing me um, and, and that really was where it started for me and then in 2018 I got my first underwater camera um, which I'll tell you more about and I went for a phase of just being any photo I took I just thought was amazing and I took this little tiny uh, juvenile squid I'm not quite sure on the species because it was about the size of my thumbnail and that was just using a, a budget compact camera and a video like that I got on eBay for about 15 pounds and I, I couldn't believe the quality that I could get with something so I mean, relatively affordable in the world of underwater photography. Um, and I started night diving regularly with my friend John Bunker and other local divers in Dorset and Devon when I eventually moved down here at the same time. Um, and it just sparked an obsession. And now every waking minute is basically just me thinking about photography. Um, but then I was really lucky. And in, in, in 2020, um, I was able to branch out a bit more and I stopped just using a, a video light that I'd got on eBay and I ended up using a strobe and I um, had a, a wide angle lens and a, a macro wet lens that I attached to my camera. And this really allowed me to start diversifying the type of photography that I did and getting a bit more creative, which I will cover and, and hopefully inspire you to do as well. Um, which eventually led to a complete surprise for me, um, the British and Irish Underwater Photography Championships. Um, I entered my first ever competition, which was that one in 2020, not even expecting to place, but hoping that I could get some feedback that would allow me to develop as a photographer. And I managed to win. <laughs> um, but I, I mentioned this because it was an amazing opportunity to start talking to people like yourselves. And, and I think competitions are very intimidating and I kind of sort of put in on a whim, but actually they're really great opportunities to meet like-minded people and be given a platform to share why you do what you do. So if you ever feel, you know, you're on the edge about entering competitions and things, I, I can't actually recommend it enough, depending on what stage you're at. I think you can get some really good feedback from it. Um, and it's, it's kind of given me a, a real chance to publish my work and also share why I love doing what I do. Um, so I just thought I'd have that in there as sort of a a little nod to the British and Irish Underwater Photography Championships and BSOUP, the British Society of Underwater Photographers. They're a really lovely bunch um, and I really recommend joining the society. It's not too expensive um, and you can join from any anywhere in the world. There we go. So this is part one of getting started and some practical tips that hopefully you'll find useful. So if you haven't picked up a camera before, or even if you have, I think one of the first questions you should ask yourself is what are you aiming to do and what really inspires you? Um, and sometimes that might be through looking at what other people are sharing and thinking what you like and dislike about what they do. But looking at it as core, what animals, what habitats, what areas of research are you really engaged with? Is there a gap that you think actually no one's really showing this? Um, and there are loads of species, particularly in the UK, that don't really have that kind of feature or that spotlight. Um, a lot of British wildlife photography is, is around sort of charismatic bird species, your puffins, your gannets. I'm talking more coastal here, of course. Uh, but people often really enjoy megafauna, rightly so. But there are so many kind of obscure habitats, whether it's wetlands or marshes or ponds, for example, and most of them are facing serious decline. So just by putting uh, any habitat or, or species or feeling that you have that is inspiring into your work, it will really ground you for success, in my opinion. And I think that's all of the photos that I've taken, whenever I've taken the photos that have been in awards or um, published, I've really felt something when I've taken that photo. And I know that sounds probably a bit wishy-washy and it's not necessarily something that you can replicate or, or, or force. But I do think that if you feel something when you're taking a photo, it's more likely to make other people feel something too. Um, 
but it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to create something that's worthy of framing and putting in a palace it can be something that's quite simple and humble it can be just a you know you might just want to, to to document a phenomenon or document your experience or document you know something you've done and that's absolutely fine too and I think that adding you into that story can make people feel things even if the imagery them itself isn't sort of technically perfect just by documenting something and getting excited about it is really powerful too and you might be thinking, actually, I like the idea of doing some something a bit more creative in time and learning some of the technicalities and different lenses and different f-stops and what they do and things like that. Um, in which case, I would think about the approach that you take and the kit that you invest in to sort of make sure that you have something that will last you rather than, you know, for example, if you're looking to point and shoot or document something at a fairly um, basic level, an action camera might work for you um, but I'll come on to that in a moment but it's just I think it's really good to just set out with what you're aiming to do before you start trying to um, spend money or or worry too much about what other people are doing just think at, at its core what is it that makes you excited and I just wanted to make a point that I obviously am very biased in that I dive regularly and I love being underwater, but a lot of marine biologists don't dive and actually don't enjoy it because it's a massive faff. It's expensive um, and it's, it's just not for everyone. Um, and that's absolutely fine. And that doesn't mean that you can't take powerful imagery for 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 marine life, actually. Um, some of the nicest shots I've seen um, taken in on our shorelines have been taken snorkeling or even just by um, rock pooling. So don't feel that scuba is necessarily entwined with everything that I'm saying. And hopefully these lessons are broadly applicable. Um, but I will be having more of an underwater focus because I think it's a lot more inaccessible for people to get started with. Um, so, yeah, there is going to be that that kind of spin there. Um, and I pop this picture of me in so I can introduce the gear that I have. The general consensus with if you're starting underwater photography, um, regardless of your aims, is that a compact camera with full manual controls is probably your best option for starting. Um, and they can range, if you get them second hand, you can pick them up for, you know, 150, 250 pounds. If you're getting them new, maybe three to 500 pounds, depending on the make and model. Um, one of my closest friends has just bought um, a compact camera that's very commonly used, the Olympus TG6. Um, and I think she paid about 300 pounds for the camera and the housing. Um, which, you know, keep an eye out on eBay. You don't have to get everything new, but compact cameras kind of future proof you. Um, I think there's often a this this uh, common marketing technique where people are, are, are sort of given a, oh, this does everything and it's very easy. Um, I don't want to name names or brands, but there are certain um, action cameras, for example, that are painted as an all rounder, but actually you might find quite quickly that you're, um, limited by what you can do with them and you actually outgrow them very quickly there are all sorts of pros and cons to different makes and models but here are a couple of ones that i know photographers um around the uk use a lot um the canon g7 and g9 series are very very popular they will future proof you um for for years i i still use the canon g9x um and that's what is in that housing there but that started off that rig as just me holding that housing and diving with that and nothing else underwater um and i've i'm i'm equally as happy with it now five years on as i was back then um the olympus tg series are amazing and the sony rx series are great the key thing that you want to look out for with compact cameras for underwater photography is that they have full manual controls um, and it's quite common for people to start using automatic modes and pointing and shooting as they might on land. But actually having the ability to change those settings and understand how they work is what will take you from kind of basic levels of photography to getting really creative and having a lot of fun. So I recommend future proofing if you do decide to invest in something with a camera that will kind of see you out for a long time. It might mean actually you probably will spend a similar amount on a high end action camera. But I would definitely recommend taking the compact route rather than going for action cameras. Um, if you want to discuss a particular make or model that you're considering, um, and obviously that's probably not the place to do it 
today but if you want to reach out to me I'll provide my contact details um, at the end and I'm more than happy to chat through rigs and things like that because it is a nightmare to navigate and sometimes questions are too specific for a setting like this and I completely understand that but this is what I started with. Um, I started, and that doesn't mean that that's the only way to start, and it doesn't mean that's the right way, but it's a way that I can vouch for, and it's brought me a, a lot of joy. Um, it's the Canon G9X Mark II, and I recognise that for many that's probably just a collection of um, numbers and letters because Canon and, uh, well, any um, camera uh, brand tends to just add a big code at the end <laughs> and it can seem quite intimidating and nonsensical and, until you get your head around it but the G9X is basically like a tiny little classic digital compact camera um, and you would not look at it and think it was capable of doing the things that it does but I absolutely love it and I take it everywhere with me um, and I have it in a fantasy housing uh, that's just the one that I have there are others available but the key thing that I would recommend um, is don't worry too much about all the accessories at first um, because they're really expensive and I think it alienates a lot of people. Once you've invested in a, a camera that will last, which might be sort of 300 ish pounds, um, you can just focus on enjoying it. Don't you know, don't feel the need to sort of invest in all this stuff because a lot of the time those accessories in themselves are a massive learning curve and I think sometimes if you buy it all at once you can find yourself not really knowing how to use the camera or any of the accessories and trying to learn and piece all of that together is quite overwhelming so just be kind to yourself and get started with a camera and some basic lighting equipment and that's what I did I um my friend John who I mentioned that I started shore diving with he had some really nice um video lights and I thought fly me they're going to be really expensive but they're about 30 pounds on eBay um I think for a pair of them and they're still available on eBay and I recommend all my friends who um, I'm kind of becoming a bit of a <laughs> I'm converting lots of my friends into doing this and they've bought the same one so I know they're still available um and I took all of the photos you can see here um with with that setup um and I I, I had video lights and nothing else for about two years um Admittedly, a lot of the the output for the, the video lights weren't amazing for daytime, but I did a lot of night photography. So it meant that I could get really powerful spotlights on this lovely John Dory here. Um, and the place image on the left actually, um, the place image placed <laughs> um, in underwater photographer of the year in two years ago in the British compact category. And it was, I think it was commended. Um, and that was just taken with a video light, two video lights from eBay for about 15 pounds and the camera and nothing else. So you can create imagery that is award winning with very little gear. Um, the main thing is just getting out there and using it and, and finding things that inspire you. And um, but now I don't know, you know, it's quite hard to pitch this to a broad audience because I'm not quite sure where people are. But I did want to include a little bit more sort of technical stuff for what I'm now doing, if people were curious. So I've broad broadened into different kinds of lighting. So I have two compact strobes, basically flash units, external flash units that I attach to my rig. Um, and those flash at the same time that I press um, the the shutter down um, and that means that I can kind of get really creative I can add a lot more light into a, uh, a scene and I've also started using a snoop which is one of my favorite things ever to exist on the planet I get stupidly excited about snooted images um, basically any underwater photo that you see where there's a black background on a, on a macro subject and it's sort of the light is very pinpointed chances are they've used a snoop for that so that bottom right image there I've used a snoop um, on that and basically lit up the center of that lovely little fan worm there and then I've also started playing around with UV um, just because I've got a couple of ideas uh, both biological and geological of things that fluoresce and I kind of want to reach out into that um, I'm basically telling you this because there's lots of different event, like kind of avenues you can go down and there isn't really a right or wrong one but again, the key thing is just finding stuff that excites you. And then lenses, um, I've given you the um, exact makes and models, just if there is anyone curious. But these are the lenses that I have. Um, I've got a fairly sort of a moderate range um, macro lens um, that Inon 
UCL 165 and that's kind of that's not very powerful and then the Nauticam the CMC one is for really super macro work um I recommend if you are sort of macro is your thing I would recommend not trying to go to super macro straight away get kind of used to how to take photos um close up generally before you try and play around with super macro lenses underwater because if you're rock pooling and you're doing it from shore not a problem if you're free diving i salute you because i'm just not capable of of taking macro photography um free diving i don't have the control for it but buoyancy is really really important and i probably should have mentioned that earlier but particularly with um with macro work when you have tides or any movement in the water any swell um you're obviously moving the animal on the seaweed is moving and the focal kind of the 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 exact sort of golden spot that you need to get something in focus with super macro is ridiculous at points um and that is one of the drawbacks of compact cameras is that you can't kind of uh, allow um for higher f numbers and and sort of cater for that and, and get huge areas in focus when you're doing macro work so do be patient before you try and run before you can walk with macro because it is a real challenge but I think it's probably one of the most rewarding underwater photography techniques um and then I've just put the 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 UWL H100 that's just the wide angle that I use and if you see any wide angle um images here that's likely the lens that I've used if anyone's curious um and I've just, oh, sorry, I've just included a couple of wide angle shots that I've then started to take. So you can just see how I'm diversifying out. You've got the lovely little grey seal at Lundy and then some fun um, split shots that I've taken um, at Charmouth of some of the fossils. And you can just basically get creative. Um, the, the more accessories that you have, I think the more inspiration that will come with that. But um, don't feel you have to to take great images. One thing I did want to point out as well about imagery is that I feel there's this association of more investment equals better output. And I think generally speaking, there's lots of arguments for that. However, um, if I ask the average person, do they think that I took these images with completely different gear? Um, they would probably say, no, I would assume that's the same gear maybe even the same animal, uh, it's not, um, uh, um, potentially all of the same accessories and settings, etc. That's not the case. Um, the image on the left I took last year in the summer, and that was using that snoot that I told you about. It's a, it's basically a way of, of spotlighting your subject and, and a flash that only spotlights a particular area rather than lighting up the whole scene. And I used a snoot for that, which cost a, a fair amount of money, a few hundred pounds, um, on the secondhand market. But the other one on the right, both Tom Pop Lenny's, um, was taken with just a single strobe um, and no lenses. I don't think I don't think I used any wet lenses for these photos. Um, and the reason why I was able to get that spotlight was because there was a rock in the way. And I used the rock to cast a shadow over the body um, where and kind of just placed my strobe behind it and cast a shadow so that only the face was lit up. Um, Obviously, there isn't a convenient rock wherever you may go um, to to get some sort of convenient snooting with your strobe or whatever equipment you may have. But you can get creative um, and you don't necessarily need to invest more money to have creative outlets is, is the point that I'm making. I put down these makes and models and things for interest, but I don't feel that you need to invest in those things to to have an output that you're happy with. I really wanted to take an image like this for quite a while um, and and was just lucky on the day that there was a really nice rock in the way. Initially, it cut out half of the, the Tom Pot's face and I realised, oh, maybe if I move it, it will snoot it perfectly. And fortunately, the Tom Pot stayed around for me to try. But yeah, just a quick lesson of don't feel that more money equals better output and I've I, I personally as a, as a student and undergraduate have felt very intimidated to be honest by underwater photography uh, and I, I still do to an extent because often you feel like you can't take photos of certain animals without money you can't take photos with certain techniques because of money but that doesn't mean you can't take images that are powerful um so moving on from gear specifically and talking about 
some specific technical tips that I recommend. Um, editing, I think this isn't spoken about enough. Um, editing is really important and it's actually really fun um, in, in my opinion. <laughs> Not everyone finds it fun, but I find it really rewarding and it doesn't have to be highly technical. Um, but it makes a massive difference. And I really wish I'd learned this earlier on um, because there are some images that I was posting everywhere just in pure excitement, not having not edited them and they looked terrible. But had I have spent a bit more time, honestly, about five clicks in Photoshop will change um, an image completely. Um, and I've used this example. This is the first dive, this photo of this cuttlefish was taken on the first dive I ever did with my own camera. And I thought this top one, this very green washed out one was the best image to ever exist because I was just so excited and I didn't really do anything with it. I just shared it and was like, wow, I found a cuttlefish. I can't believe it. Um, but actually, uh, uh, there are a few technical problems with this image. It's a bit blown out in places. There isn't any external lighting. It's a bit dark and I didn't white balance at all. But last night while playing around in Photoshop, I managed to... It, just using changing the white balance changing the contrast um and changing the saturation um, and cropping it i managed to get the image to that um don't get me wrong still not a perfect image but i think people a lot of the time when i see new people starting and they're sharing all the stuff that they've done on instagram it's lovely to see and there's nothing wrong with sharing the images as they come from the camera but just play around with editing. You might find that your result is elevated way beyond your expectations. And I've had images before that I've thought there's no way that'll be, uh, in fact, the, the seal image that I showed um, here. Oh, where's it gone? Sorry, my my um, laptop's a bit delayed. This seal image, I thought this was going in the bin because I thought um, the, the, the amount of plankton in the water and the general um, just exposure of the image was too too far gone for me to actually do anything with um but i managed to recover it um fairly easily in in photoshop so sometimes even the images that you might not expect to be good end up being something quite special just from a little bit of patience in in any editing software that uh, doesn't have to be photoshop um and another thing i really recommend not doing what i did <laughs> And when I had my video lights, I used the auto um, setting and the burst mode because I thought if I just hold my finger down and have it on the auto setting, one of them's going to be right at some point and then that will be fine. And to be honest, yes, that does work to an extent. And I have that that place image was taken with that came um, that was that was um, in the underwater photographer of the year competition that was taken using that methodology. Um, <laughs> it does work. However, it's incredibly haphazard and you don't really know why something's gone right or why something's gone wrong. Um, and very often you'll find that um, whites end up really, really bright and overexposed to the point where the data is just white when you try and edit it um it doesn't really allow for you to have any flexibility you can't get creative with your lighting or anything um and shutter speed also means that sometimes when you just shoot on auto all the time when things move you'll find that they blur very easily so i really recommend i know it's very intimidating if you haven't done it before but if you start to learn why different manual controls like your f-stop your shutter speed and your iso how they work and interplay with one another um it's it's worth doing uh, it, it is intimidating but i definitely recommend doing it early on rather than later don't be like me don't be lazy and shooting in RAW, um, most of the compact cameras that I've, um, in fact, all of the compact cameras that I listed on the previous slides, they all have the cap capacity to shoot in RAW, but you have to turn that on. Um, and by shooting in RAW, it means that when you go into the editing software, you can access all of the data about that image. It's not just a, a kind of, I guess, a flat um, image. You've got all of those values for all of the different colours and layers. And it means that I didn't shoot in RAW when I took this photo. Had I shot in RAW, I imagine I could have restored it to a much better standard in post-processing. Um, 
And I think this is a general life lesson, um, but there are lots of people that do underwater photography um, all across the world and, and do wildlife photography. It's very competitive, but don't compare yourself. Um, just have fun with it, because I think you can end up constantly feeling a bit. Wow, there's, there's you know, there will always be someone better photographing something rarer. And that doesn't matter. The thing is, is that you're taking something that's meaningful to you and meaningful to the local community as well. If you're taking pictures of uh, local fauna. Um, and I've, I've said this point already, but financial investment doesn't always equal better results. So just bear that in mind. Um, and this is a fairly. Um, You don't have to go very deep or very far offshore to see amazing things. All of these photos have been taken in less than two meters of water. Um, the photo with all of the um, in the big bait ball that was taken in Babacoom, and I was in I was in standing depth when I took that photo. The same for the little black goby in the seagrass. The same for the little squid and the velvet swimmer classic rock pool species all of these have been taken in almost standing water if not about two two meters um i'm a real fan of just sitting and observing and waiting or, or or just enjoying the scenery around you and taking your time um i often find that the people that swim really far and go all around a wreck or go whatever they'll see a lot less than the people that tend to just take their time and enjoy the experience. Um, even if you don't see something, I feel like it's just nicer to just take in what you're seeing um, around you, even if there isn't a specific subject you have available to you. So I'm doing all right for time, actually. That's the first part, and that's more of the kind of practical tips of um, what I wish I'd been told earlier on. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've I've separated it just in case you have somewhere to be and the more conceptual parts um, uh, and the kind of inspiration side of it is not something that you need or you have other commitments. So part two is basically my, I guess it's a plea really <laughs> of why I think imagery is so important to marine conservation and, and particularly in the UK. Um, and I think with this kind of motto and this outlook, um, it might maybe change how you take photos or why you take photos or what you do with the photos that you take that's what I hope anyway so I'll start off with an anecdote and this is really where I guess everything I'm talking to you about today stemmed from and it's a, a just a, a personal experience I had when I um, I did a, a week's work placement at London Aquarium when I was uh, 16 17 something like that um, and at that point, I'd already developed my weird obsession for stalking Facebook groups and trying to identify rock pool species for absolutely no reason. Um, and and I realised that actually there's a lot of really colourful, beautiful animals on our shoreline. Um, and that kind of ended up with me wanting to study marine biology. But when I was at London Aquarium, we had a, a day where school children came in and there was a card sorting activity and they had all these different cards sorted out on the floor. Uh, well, not sorted out on the floor. I say jumbled on the floor and they contained anything from sort of small pink nudibranchs to blue sharks to humpback whales to cod mackerel, um, some brown seaweeds, uh, what else was there? A lot of the classic commercial fish that you'd expect um, to see um, fairly neutral in colour. Um, and the children and the staff members of the school, um, this is a primary school, were asked to sort them into two categories. Ones that they thought came uh, or you could find in the UK, either seasonally or all the time. Um, and ones that were exotic species that weren't able to be seen in the UK and you might be able to guess where I'm going with this but what the children and the staff did is anything that was remotely colourful and conventionally cute including seals um, or seahorses, nudibranchs, uh, sharks, they were all put into the tropical species pile and anything that was grey, uh, fairly commercial, classic North Sea fish was put into the native marine species pile. A couple of the snails were lucky to make it in there as well. But generally, the trend, with a few exceptions, was that anything that didn't look as conventionally exciting 
was associated with native marine species. Um, and I, I just thought it was really sad. Um, and, oh, I'm hoping that that's, oh, and and go moving forward, it's one of the most common responses I have to my photography when I talk about what I've done um, or shown people what I've taken. It's a classic, oh, this wasn't taken abroad. I thought it was taken in the tropics. Or is it really that colourful down there? And another classic is I thought it was just mud. Um, but unfortunately, it's not just anecdotes that I've experienced that kind of back this idea up. Um, the public's perception in terms of research um, shows that the types of species that we have in the UK are, are, are underestimated and traditionally charismatic animals and colourful species are less likely to be associated with UK waters um, on bigger public perception um, surveys with thousands of participants. Even things like the humble Tompot Blenny is not associated with UK waters simply because it's colourful. Um, in contrast, plain and less colourful species are more commonly associated with UK waters. So your whelks um, and just generally anything that's brown, <laughs> basically. Um, um, but it's not just the, the type of wildlife, it's also the amount of wildlife that the public underestimate. So there's a really great study um, by Rosa Tal from 2008 um, that shows... Uh, from a, a survey of 3,000 people in the UK and they were asked to describe from a set of criteria what they think the seabed would be like um, beneath the region that they live or off the coast where they visit for seaside holidays. And 44% of the respondents said that they considered the seabed to be generally mostly or utterly barren. They have a very pessimistic outlook on what our seabeds look like. But of course, if you study this, um, like many of us are really fortunate to do, we have this real blessing of knowing that there's way more out there. Um, whether it's kind of your soft corals and your urchins and the colours that they bring, or even the sandy flats that are kind of associated with very little, um, actually can have some really cool charismatic crabs in there. Um, I've spent hours um, over sandy flats at night and you'll find lovely bobtail squid, different crabs, big flatfish, um, and some of the kind of fights that you can witness between crabs always makes me laugh. Um, and then in the summer, you've got the lovely big bait balls that come in and the white bait and the, the mackerel chasing them in on shore. We know that there are amazing things to see in UK waters, but a lot of people aren't lucky enough to see it or don't have the opportunity or aren't able bodied enough. Um, and this extends further as well. So in terms of ecological value, um, native species with the greatest ecological value um, are typically ranked the least interesting. So in this survey, they were given a list ranging from merle to cod to nudibranchs of things. And they were asked basically, how interesting do you find this species? Would you like to know more about it? And the ones that are typically favoured for highest e uh, ecological services um, were consistently ranked the least interesting by the public. Um, 65% of respondents recognised seagrass, but less than 10% listed seagrass as a species they would like to know more about. And something I found really interesting about this um, is that seagrass is obviously a habitat and I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted about how important seagrass is for a collection of reasons, whether it's carbon storage or nurseries for commercial and, and non-commercial species, et cetera, et cetera. However, seahorses, on the other hand, which we know live in, depend on seagrass for feeding, breeding, et cetera, were ranked as the most interesting. Um, they're very, there's a very kind of, uh, individual centric idea of of what's interesting in the UK and the individual seahorses are fascinating to the public but the habitats they live in ha are of no interest whatsoever so we need to create imagery that also inspires people about the scenery and the beauty of just being there not just the animals themselves and of course um I'm sure many of you have, have, have engaged with seagrass related research, but I pop this in because it's a fairly new one um, to do with how much seagrass um, meadows have shrunk in, in the last sort of century and how dire the situation is. So there's a real need for people to care. We need people to care more than ever, uh, but they they don't. Unfortunately, they don't. And I, I do 
have well <laughs> you can probably tell i think pictures are really powerful for changing that so just to recap people don't un people underestimate the amount of species and habitats um, in the uk the color and charisma of marine species and habitats and find the ones most ecologically important of least interest so why do your images matter here um Personal experiences of marine environments um, have been found to be important for developing an interest and support of conservation. If people have practical hands on experience with a species or habitat, they're far more likely to conserve it. But how do you do that when the animal might be 30 metres down at the bottom of the sea or even five metres down or one metre down? It, it takes a certain inclination and it also takes uh, possibly financing if they don't live near the sea or uh, just pre-existing knowledge um, and also health, um, whether you're uh, not able-bodied because of age or because of some other underlying problem uh, or, or even people who are, are, are afraid of the water. There are lots of different reasons why people won't be just casually stumbling across a hermit crab. Um, but I do think one of the main things that imagery can do is it gives a sense of atmosphere and place in an environment um, the audience may never experience or visit themselves and if that's not worth celebrating and pushing for i don't know what is um and i, I always include this picture because it's one of a, a lovely little tub gurners you might have seen them if you ever um do sort of fish surveying over sandy habitats or muddy habitats classic uk species and i took this photo didn't really think much of it um and i showed one of my elderly neighbors who's approaching 90 um and she i showed her it a couple of years ago actually and a lot of the time when i see her now she asks to see it again she's obsessed with it she's obsessed with how colorful the eye is and just how beautiful this this animal is and she'd never seen one before and she said to me the other day that through knowing me um she's she's realized that uk seas are beautiful and i think that is something that you don't have to be uh, you know as keen as i am with photography to make people aware and make people feel excited um, and I use that photo because it's not technically perfect it's not going to win any awards it's not going to go on someone's wall but it made one person feel something and feel inspired and just by going out there taking a photo and going hey look at this cool thing I saw yesterday you can have a real big impact on how people view the world around them um, oh sorry my um, laptop's being really good at freezing yeah, so we saw it with the Blue Planet effect. Scientists knew about plastics and the problems of plastics for a very long time, but it took some powerful imagery um, of the, I think this is a WWF circulated one of the the turtle with the straw up its nose and um, I think it was sperm whales. I can't remember. There was the plastic bag scene that kind of everyone felt awful watching. And suddenly legislation started to change very soon after that. Um, I know correlation doesn't always imply causation, but I do think that uh, politicians and people generally have lots of excuses to ignore marine life and when you show them something so tangible so emotive so sad there's less reason for them to find an excuse to ignore it um but there are absolutely no criteria for what imagery can make people feel something um you don't have to do you don't have to take any of the advice i've taken uh, or i've given you today to to make people feel stuff it can just be a you know, non-white balanced, non-edited, non-cropped picture of something that someone hasn't seen before. And they go, wow, I didn't know we had that. That's all it takes. Um, and it's that sharing of perspective. So a lot of people, when they look out and see a scene, this is one of my favourite places in the world. This is looking over from Blackfern towards Charmouth Beach in Lime Bay. Um, they might just think this, this is what is under the water. It's going to be green. It's going to be muddy. But when I look out to sea, and I'm sure when many of you look out to sea, we're inspired. And I think, oh, if it loads, <laughs> oh, you know, this is a, a wreck that I took. It's not quite in shot there. It's slightly to the right. But this is a, a photo that I took on a wreck. Got some lovely bib, cuckoo wrasse, spider crabs. There's thousands of bib that live on that wreck. I think of a thriving system. I think of the tiny little squidge and the macro life and the breeding nudibranchs I'll see during spring. Or I think of the classic velvet swimmer aggressively trying to get rid of me as I approach it in a rock pool. Um, or some people like to free dive and spearfish, and they might, some divers have more of a kind of um, subsistence kind of food orientated 
perception. Um, but that's also inspiring and, and the way that people rely on on the sea for food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, I'm painting one note because I have my own biases and and, and perspectives and, and reasons why I dive. But some people dive for food, some people spearfish for food. Um, and that can be really interesting to certain demographics as well. So there's loads of different perceptions that you can share and change this perception to this, even if the people haven't seen those things directly. Um, so here are my final thoughts. Um, underwater imagery really doesn't have to break the bank and can be a very powerful tool for conservation. But the public can't play a role in fighting to protect native habitats and species if they don't know they exist. And probably the most important thing I'd say, um, I've termed it the burden of creation. When you create something, you are burdened with always seeing its flaws. Um, and this applies for scientific writing. It applies to photography, to artwork, to anything that you make, you will see the flaws in it. But that really shouldn't stop you from feeling like you can share it with others. And I almost guarantee you in fact I do guarantee you that you'll be surprised how much joy you can bring to others by sharing what you've seen um no matter how the, the technical execution played out it's always worth sharing your excitement with marine life about others um and questions hopefully I've finished roughly with sufficient time I think that was bang on 45 minutes um I've also got an absolutely shameless plug here at the end um I've recently made my first debut independent film it's written shot directed by me um at, at Charmouth and it's about life at Charmouth both both prehistoric and present um and if you wanted to watch it, you can check it out on YouTube and that would mean a lot to me. So if you have any questions whatsoever, more than happy to take them now. But you can also contact me on Instagram and Twitter slash my email, whichever you prefer. Thank you so, so much, Georgie. That was an amazing presentation. Um, we do have quite a few questions. I'm not sure if we're going to manage to get <laughs> no through worries. them all. Um, I'm going to just start because Hank has his hand up. Um, Hank, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Oh, you're on. Yep. Hi, Georgie. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for a very interesting talk. It's a nice line of work that you do. Thank you. Um, I I have a question. Well, I've put two green questions on our notice board there. Um, I've got sort of a technical techie GoPro versus full DSLR rig question. Mm. But in the interest of time, I think the more interesting one is is my second question, which picks up on what you just said about sh sharing of images. So there are a lot of cameras out there, both in the amateur market, professional market, and, you know, there's a scientific market now. There are AUVs that go out and hoover up tens of thousands of images per dive. Yeah. Actually, it's, 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 it's a problem. There are so many images now that we can't analyze all the information that's contained in them. But one of the places where, where, where there could be massive untapped potential is in the volunteer in the amateur photographer market where people are going out with cameras through sea search through their hobbies um collecting uh really good stuff because yeah. a lot of the cameras are really good i'm just wondering um uh about do you think there's an appetite there if such a thing existed say and maybe there are places where people can share the imagery but like if a national database existed where people could pool their images, upload them to it. And then let's say there was a fancy pants um, algorithm that could analyze the imagery, which will happen in five to 10 years time. Um, do you think people would buy into that? Do you think they'd want to contribute that? Obviously they're giving away some of you know their copyright, but the greater good would be that we'd, we'd get much better species and habitat records across the UK. Have you got any thoughts on that? I absolutely think there's an appetite for it. And I when I give this, I give a slightly different talk or I have given a slightly different talk to current underwater photographer groups. And one of the main things is that I think people are either kind of they think that you're either arty or you're scientific with your your approach. And that's usually not the case in my experience. People who take photos actually have amazing identification knowledge. They know so much about the local habitats and they really care about them. They feel a real sense of stewardship towards them. But it's often I think people do feel intimidated by taxonomy and that's why sometimes sea search isn't getting the engagement that it deserves. But I think if there was a way to automate that, like you say, 
I I know that there would be a lot of people that would be willing to submit imagery towards that. And we see it fairly often with more charismatic species, Gavin Cooks and the cephalopod um, citizen science project. And a lot of divers I know, whenever they see a cephalopod on their dives, they'll pop it in his Facebook group and he adds that to his.